Hello, today I'll be doing a video on uh, Richard the Lionheart. This game came out in 2017. I just got it recently uh, as a Father's Day gift from one of my kids. So uh, I've played it uh, one time solo and uh, thought I'd go ahead and do a how to set up and play video on this. So let's get started with how to set up. First thing you'll do is put the board in the play area. Make sure that you're using the side of the board for the number of players uh, you're playing with. Um, this side is for four to six. It is a double-sided board. Um, the other side, as you can see, is for two to three players. I'm going to uh, play on the four-player side. Normally I set up uh, three-player games in these how-to-play videos, but in the uh, four or more player, side there was a couple of other figures that are involved that uh, I wanted to see how those work so I played it four player just because of that um, in the end they really didn't seem to make a lot of difference but I will just show that so I'll play a four player game next you take this crusade board and set it alongside the uh, map but I'm gonna have to set it this way just because I don't have enough room course if you do have enough room you know probably want to set it the long way then on this board you'll place the Richards army figure which is this one where he's got an axe on the zero figure under the Richards army uh, and there's also a corresponding image there and similarly you'll take this Saladin's army figure and place it on the zero space here just above where it says Saladin's army and there's a image here so that goes here on the crusade board then you'll take this figure the king's return figure and put that on the 10th space of this king's return track like so and there's uh, well the image doesn't really look like that figure but anyway it's this figure it goes on uh, space 10 of the king's return and then you take this figure, um, which I'm not sure what he's supposed to look like. Um, anyway, he goes on the King's Treasure track on the Space 10. And again, that's here on the Crusade board. Up here on the purchase area of the Crusade board, you'll take the Game Round token and put it on the first round space. That will be for the first round of the game. Next you'll place the horse, ship, and faction skill tokens somewhere next to the boards where players can reach. You'll then place this reserve board uh, here somewhere next to the uh, crusade board. You'll then give players their character dashboards. Um, the game is divided into two factions. You have John's faction which has the green colors and you have uh, King Richard's faction which has the red colors in a uh, game with an even number of players like two four or six you'll have an equal number of players playing each uh, faction so in a four player game like I'm setting up I'll have two players playing uh, Richard faction characters and two players playing uh, John faction characters. If you happen to have an odd number of players, uh, like three players, then you would have one player playing a Richard faction character, one player playing a John faction character, and one player playing a, a neutral faction a character, which would be Leopold. And if you had five players, you would have two characters Two players playing Richard characters, two players uh, playing uh, John characters, and one player playing a neutral character, that being Marie of France. And of course, if you had six players, then you'd have three players playing Richard characters and three players playing John characters and no neutral character, just as uh, we will have only playing four players. 
And you can determine how you assign the characters to people, either randomly or by choice, however you want to do it. I just happened to pick these, so I'll have Friar Tuck and Robin Hood on the Richards uh, faction, and Isabella and Sheriff of Nottingham on the um, John's character. Each player will take their corresponding figure, so that's Friar Tuck, uh, Robin Hood, and they'll also take their starting coins, which you'll see Friar Tuck here starts the game with two coins, Robin Hood starts the game with one coin, and then you just use this area of your board to place your coins. Alright, so now I've got that done for all four characters. Then it says just to place the remaining coins, uh, coins near the boards, but I'll just put mine in this little uh, token holder. You're then going to form your crusade deck, so you'll uh, take one card of each type. So one Richard Hourglass, one Richard Banner, one Richard Full Chest, uh, one Green Banner, Green Chest, and Green Hourglass, and then shuffle those. That will form your starting Crusade deck, so you just put that somewhere nearby. You then create the Provision deck by taking 15 cards from each of these decks, 15 of each type, so for a total of 90 and shuffle that up and that will create your provision deck so let me do that off camera you then take that provision deck and place it here on the reserve board where it shows you then take the remaining influence cards and just place them by type uh, on the reserve board here where it shows like so. So you have your provision deck and then the different uh, spaces for the remaining influence cards. You then take the edict cards, separate them by back. There's five of each. If you're not playing with a neutral player, you won't need the neutral edict cards. You'll then shuffle each of these decks up and deal one to each player according to their faction. So for the Richard faction, uh, you'll shuffle and deal one edict card to Friar Tuck and Robin Hood here and then for the uh, Prince John faction you'll shuffle the green backed edict cards and deal one to Isabella and one to the sheriff so let me get that taken care of all right I've dealt one edict card to each player then you just set the other the remaining edict cards nearby they may come into play um, again the, the neutral faction cards will not come into play if you're not playing with the neutral faction Players will want to keep these edict cards hidden because they give them a way that they'll earn uh, extra prestige in the game. So for instance, this one that the Sheriff of Nottingham got. If the, if the King's Treasure Track reaches zero, remember this is the King's Treasure Track. If that reaches zero, he'll gain five prestige points. So that's, that's something that he'll be aiming toward uh, during the game. We'll look at his Bellas here. Um, gain one prestige point per Saladin's banner card in her hand. That's these green ones here. And we'll see what Robin Hood got. Gain one prestige point per uh, Red Richard's Hourglass card in your hand. So that would be those. He would want to collect those cards in his hand to earn prestige at the end of the game. Extra prestige. And Friar Tuck got if the King's Return track reaches zero, which is this track here. Uh, he'll gain five prestige points. So again, the players will want to keep those secret, and those are goals that they'll be working toward, uh, toward trying to uh, help themselves win the game. Next, you'll shuffle this event deck, and it says event on it. After you've shuffled that, just place that somewhere near the board. Next, you'll deal seven cards from the provision deck to each player. If you were playing with a neutral player, they would get 10 cards instead of 7. So let me get that done. Alright, so I've dealt 7 
cards from the provision deck to each player. You then place, place these prestige point tokens uh, somewhere near the board. There's also uh, some ones, uh, prestige point tokens that have a brown color. These are worth three prestige points and the purple ones are worth one. So just place all those somewhere near the board. Again, there's my coins. If playing with four or more players, you'll place the mercenary and merchant figure somewhere near the board. You'll then randomly choose a first player and give them the first player token. I'm just going to choose Friar Tuck, Tuck to be my first player, so he'll get the first player token. If you were playing with a neutral player, they would get this neutral player token since we're not. I'll just set that aside, but I will talk about what that's for later when I'm explaining the rules. And there is a little uh, you know, player aid round overview card that you can deal to each player as well. Other than that, we are set up and ready to play. Alright, so how do we play? <clears throat> well, there's seven phases in a round. And uh, the first phase um, is the event card and neutral support phase. So first thing will happen, the first player, the player with the first player token will draw the event card and uh, place it. And it'll have some effects. So this at the end of the round, if the king's return track decreased this round, decrease it in additional space. So it'll just have a different... Most of the events are all something that happened at, happen at the end of the round or near the end of the round. And then it also has an uh, indication of where you will place the mercenary and merchant figure, which they have you know a minor effect, which I'll talk about later when we start talking about locations. But you'd see uh, at the end of the round uh, is when you'll place these and the mercenary will go on space 5 and the merchant will go on space 15 but we'll talk more about that later so at this point nothing in th this event card um, really matters right now other than uh, you know you may want to uh, um, have the king's return track decrease if you're the uh, Richards faction, the John faction, uh, would not want that to happen. And we'll talk about that more when we get to how you win the game. So I said this phase is the event card and neutral support phase. So we've shown what the event card, the first player draws the event card. Then if you had a neutral player, they would use this token to, dis to uh, display which faction they choose to support this turn. So they could... Um, display it this way meaning they're going to support uh, Richard this turn or this way meaning they're going to support John this turn and that comes into effect uh, depending on which locations that neutral player may choose um, because some of them are better for the Richard uh, King Richard faction and some are better for the Prince, Fa Prince John faction and so the neutral player each round will determine which one they are supporting but again, uh, we don't have a neutral player in a four-player game, so we won't deal with that. The next phase is the traveling and encounter phase, and that's where players will move their figures around on the England board here. And um, so you will start with the first player, and they will travel to a location and perform an encounter there. Now normally, you can move up to three spaces, along roads um, when you're traveling if you have we haven't talked about purchasing yet but you, there is option where you can purchase a boat and that lets you go across rivers here you can also purchase a horse which allows you to move up to four locations uh, instead of three a player can never pass through the same location twice when they're moving. So they couldn't, you know, go from here, Bristol, to Gloucester, to Shrewsbury, back to Gloucester. Um, so you can never pass back over the same location twice. You, you have to leave. You can't stay in the location you started at. 
a player cannot end their movement at the same location as another player. You, you can pass through a location that has another player, and you do have the option when you're passing through a location that has another player where you can lose one movement point um, to draw a card from the player who is at that location, draw a random card from their hand. So if this player here, Robin Hood player, was moving and he could move up to three, that's the standard. So maybe he moves to Oxford, gives up one of his movement points, draws a random card out of the Sheriff of Nottingham's hand. Now he's down to two movement points instead of three, so he could only move one more space then instead of two more. So anyway, you have that option. And once you uh, end your movement at a location, then you uh, perform the encounter at that location. The ones with uh, this symbol are better for the King Richard players. The ones with this symbol are usually better for the uh, Prince John players, although some, it doesn't matter that the location is equal for either one of them. Now there is this on the four, uh, six player side of the board, this red Bridgewater location. Even though a uh, Prince John faction um, character can move through or end their movement on that uh, location, they cannot perform the encounter there. And similarly, this green tinted location, uh, even though a King Richard character could move onto that location, they could not perform the uh, encounter at that location. Any of the other locations, uh, you may perform the encounter there if you want to or and or are able to. But uh, this one is only can only be performed by the King Richard, and this one can only be performed by the Prince John faction players. Now, on the first turn of the game, because there are nobody has their character on the board, you're um, instead of traveling, you choose a location, and that's where you place your character, and then you'll perform that encounter there. Then, in future turns you will use your movement points to move around to the different locations, either along roads or once you have a ship, you can move across water, as I said. So that's the uh, traveling and encounter um, phase. And I'll talk more about what all the different locations are uh, here in a little bit. I will mention that once the mercenary and uh, merchant do get put on the board. If you end your um, movement in a location that contains one of them, after you do your encounter you get a bonus. So if you end where the mercenary is, you get to draw two cards from the provision deck into your hand. If you end where the merchant is, you get to take two coins from the supply into, back into your personal supply. And remember, those are placed and moved uh, at the end of the round by the event card. So you'll do the traveling and encounter phase in turn order. So it'll begin with the first player. They will you know, do their travel, uh, do their encounter, then the next player in clockwise order. will do their travel encounter and so on until each player has had a turn to do their travel and their encounter. Then you move on to the next phase, which is the purchase phase. In the purchase phase, starting with the first player, each player going in clockwise order will get a turn to make a purchase um, from items up here on the purchase board. So it depends on where the round marker is, um, tells you what the cost will be for that round. So during the first round, you can see to purchase a horse would cost you three coins. Um, you can make, you can only, during the purchase phase, you can only purchase one thing, so one of these items. So you could either purchase a horse for three coins, which again, that gives you one extra movement point, a ship for three coins, that lets you go across water. Um, you can do a faction upgrade for three coins. 
And these are the token. You know, if you purchase a horse, you take this and you know put it on your board. If you purchase a ship, you take the ship token and put it on your board. And if you purchase a faction upgrade, you get the one for your faction. So this player would uh, purchase the faction, the Richard faction skill. And when you have that, it basically unlocks this power that's on your board. So for Friar Tuck here, then after resolving an action on a red location, which those are the usually they have this red border and usually their faction symbol is on there. So, you know, he would have the power after resolving an action on a red location, draw and discard one card. So he would be able to draw one card from the provision deck into his hand, and then he would have to discard one card from his hand back into one of the reserve spots, um, depending on which one he discards. So you can purchase those. You can also... Uh, for three coins, purchase one card of your choice from the reserve, one of these, your, your choice. Or you can see for one coin here, you could purchase the top card from the provision deck. Or you can purchase for one coin, one prestige point. And then you would just take one of these prestige points and put it in your play area. And as you can see, as the rounds move on some of the costs go down and some of the costs go up so you have the option again during the purchase phase starting with the first player and going in clockwise order to purchase one of those items um, and if, if you want to it's optional of course and some of these characters um, do have a Ability like for our tuck here at the beginning of the purchase phase you may trade one faction card so a faction card is a card in your hand that is the color of your faction. So for a Richard player um, doing this power um, at the beginning of the purchase phase, you may trade one faction card. So it would have to be one of the red cards, a card that meets his faction. So he could trade that, putting it into the reserve for two random cards from the provision deck. So there's different abilities. Um, but again, like... This one for Isabella at the beginning of the purchase fade, you can, she can discard one card. So she can discard any one card. It doesn't have to be one of her faction cards. But Sheriff of Nottingham does have to, at the beginning of the phase, you may trade one faction card for two random cards. So he would have to trade one of his green cards because he's uh, a Prince John player um, and then get two random provision cards. So, again, anytime it says a faction card, that is a card that matches your faction. And that brings me to a point I will mention that the rule book is not very clear on a lot of these things, like, you know, like these powers where it says you may trade one faction card. There was no explanation on what that meant in the rule books, that that meant, you know, it had to be one of your color. Um, so I just had to do some research on BoardGameGeek.com. And there are some other things that uh, just were very unclear in the rule book. So it's definitely definitely not uh, the greatest rule book. Um, but you can, with a little bit of research, figure out most of it. I mean, there's some things that I'm not 100% sure of, but I'm, I'm pretty sure, um, at least from what I've been able to, uh, research and figure out. I think I have the rules pretty good. Anyway, let's move on. So we're at the, we uh, talked about the purchase phase. We then go on to the contribute to the crusade uh, phase. Now remember, we started with a crusade deck of six cards at the beginning during setup. So in the uh, contribute to the crusade phase, Starting with the first player, each player must contribute two cards from their hand to the Crusade deck. It's also known as the course of the Crusade deck, which I figured out through some research. But um, So they, they must contribute two cards to the Crusade deck. You can pay two coins to add an additional card to the Crusade deck. You do have the option to contribute 
uh, less cards, um, but for every card you don't donate, you have to lose one prestige point if you have them. If you don't have them, then you just nothing happens um, if you don't contribute. So you could you need to contribute two. If not, you could contribute one, but then you got to lose a prestige prestige point if you had one, or uh, contribute zero, um, and then lose two prestige points if you have them. So starting with the first player, he will do that. Then the next player in clockwise order will do that. Then the next player. And so forth until all players have had the opportunity to contribute two cards. Once that's happened, you move on to the outcome of the Crusade phase, where the first player will grab the Crusade deck, then he'll shuffle it so you know nobody knows what cards players played to it. He'll shuffle it, and then he'll draw a number of cards from that Crusade deck, depending of, on the number of the player of the game players in the game. So, it's you'll draw a number of two times a number of cards that equals two times the number of players. So, in a four-player game, you would draw eight cards from the Crusade deck. Then the first player will reveal all the cards in the Crusade deck, and start comparing them. So, the first thing you'll do is compare. The number of banner cards um, that come up. If there are more red banner cards than there are green banner cards, then you'll move the Richard's army figure, oh, this should be there, um, a number of spaces equal to the difference. So if there was four red banner cards and two green banner cards in the um, crusade deck, then there was two more red banner cards than green banner cards so Richard's army would move two spaces along the track. If there was more green banner cards than red banner cards again you move at the difference so if there was you know two red banner cards and three green banner cards the difference is one so Saladin's army would end up moving one space. If it's the same number of banner cards or there were no banner cards drawn then that's a stalemate and neither moves on their track. Neither army moves on the track. Next you'll compare um, the number of red hourglass cards uh, to green hourglass cards. If there ends up being more green hourglass cards in the crusade deck then the king's return figure does not move. If there are more red hourglass cards than green hourglass cards then the return of the king. Um, this is supposed to symbolize Richard's return from the crusade. So if there's more red than green, then the king's return figure will move two spaces along the track. And if there's the same number of red and green hourglass cards or no red or green hourglass cards, then the king's return figure just moves one space along the track towards zero. And finally you'll compare the number of uh, red ch treasure chest cards to green treasure chest cards. If there are more green than red cards then you'll decrease the king's treasure uh, figure two spaces along the track. If there are more red treasure chests than green che treasure chests, then the king's treasure track does not move at all. Or if the number of red treasure chests and green is equal to the number of green tre treasure chests, or if there is no red or green tre treasure chests in the cr crusade deck, then you move the king's treasure one towards zero. So that ends the outcome of the crusade phase. So that's either, you know, Richard's army is winning um, the battles of Saladin's army. He's getting closer to returning or his treasury is running out. So what's good for Richard's faction, the red faction, is for Richard's army to move further along and for the king's return to happen. Um, what's good for the Green faction or Prince John's faction is for Saladin's army to de be defeating Richard's army or for the king's treasury to be emptying. 
Next, you'll resolve the event card. If it's, if it's not one of the event cards that happens in an earlier round, then you'll resolve the event card that and most, most of them will be at the end of round. So in this case, like this one, if the King's Return track, which is this one, um, decreased this round, then you would decrease it in additional space. And then, as I mentioned, you'd then place the mercenary figure on space number five, which the numbers are up here, and the uh, merchant figure on space number 15. And that resolves the event card. And then you would just discard this event card. Finally, you get to the seventh phase, which is the check for the end of game phase, and you'll check for it in this order. You check if Richard's army has been has reached the last space on the track. Uh, if that hasn't happened, you check if Saladin, Saladin's army has reached the last space on the track. If that hasn't happened, you check if the King's Return track has reached zero. And if that hasn't happened, you check if the King's Treasure track has reached zero. And finally, if none of those things have happened, if the round you just played was the final round of the game, that would finally trigger the end game condition. So any of those things um, happen, any of those tracks reach their end, that triggers the end game. Or if you the round um, token is down on round 10 and you finish that round, that would also end the, trigger the end game. If the end game was not triggered, then you take all of the uh, outcome of the crusade cards that you revealed and place them in their appropriate spaces on the reserve deck or the reserve board. You move the round token one space forward uh, on its track. You pass the first player, po player token to the left. And then you would begin the next round, starting with the new first player, and of course they would start with the event phase. If one of those game end triggers happens, that will um, mean that one of the factions um, has won, but only the player um, from the winning faction that has the most prestige points is the actual winner of the game. So if Richard's army uh, track is the reaching the end is what triggers the end game, then only the factions, the player, the characters from Richard's faction have the chance of winning the game, and whichever of them has the most prestige points is the winner. If Saladin's army track reaches the end, then only the Prince John faction players have the chance of winning the game and only the whichever amongst them has the most prestige points is the winner. If if the re king's return track is what triggers the end of the game, then again only the Richards faction players have the chance to win, and only the one um, with the most prestige points among them will win. And similarly, if the king's treasure runs out then that's the Prince John faction players that have the opportunity to win. And again, the one among them that has the most prestige points will be the winner. If multiple tracks have reached the end, um, then which faction wins determined, is determined by the order in which I mentioned earlier. So it always starts with the Richards army. So if both the Richards army and the King's uh, treasure both reached zero, or, you know, kings re both reached the end of their track in the, at the same round, then it would be the Richards faction that actually, that, that player, that faction's players have the opportunity to win um, because that is higher up on the list. So remember, I said you start with Richards' army, then Saladin's army, then King's return, then King's treasure, uh, or finally the end of the 10th round. So once the winning faction has be, been determined, then the players from amongst that winning faction score any points from their edict card and then add any prestige points they've collected um, from playing on locations and whichever has the most prestige points will be the winner. 
if there is a tie amongst them um, for the most prestige points, then uh, whoever has the most coins is the winner, and if there's still a tie there, then they share the victory. But again, only one faction, the faction who did not win doesn't doesn't matter how many prestige points they have they don't have the opportunity to win the game and i should mention if playing with a neutral player the only way the neutral player can win is if neither of these tracks the richard's army saladin's army king's return and king's treasure if neither of those tracks in the game uh, it, the neutral player only has the chance to win the game if the uh, round, if you end the game by round 10 being completed. Um, if round 10 is completed before any of these tracks um, reach their end, then the neutral player gets three bonus prestige points for that. And then again, it's the player with the most prestige points. So if the game ends because the round track reached 10, and none of these tracks uh, reached their end, then there's not a faction that wins the game. So at that point, it's any player that has the most prestige points will be the winner. So I'm not going to go over uh, all the locations. Um, the iconography, I guess it kind of tells you what what happens at that location but it's not uh, completely intuitive um, but there is an appendix at the end of the rules that tell you what the what the encounters at the locations are so I'll just go over a few of them let's talk about uh, Bridgewater here and I will mention I think there's a difference on the depending on which side of the board you're playing if you're playing with two or three player or the four to six player the encounter you have at the location is different. So if a Richard faction player ends their uh, movement here and does this encounter, they pay one coin um, to the supply and that will earn them one prestige point and then they can take one card, uh, one red card from the reserve. And then all the other Richard faction players are allowed to take one card of their red red card of their choice from the reserve. Uh, Canterbury here, um, if you end your uh, movement there, um, you can turn in two uh, green banner cards to receive one red banner, one red hourglass, one red treasure, one random card, so one card from the top of the provision deck and one uh, prestige token and we'll and we'll just look at one more Nottingham if a player ends their uh, movement there they can draw one edict card from their faction's edict deck remember you got drawn one edict card at the beginning but if you move to Nottingham you get to draw one edict card from your faction um, and then return one of the your edict cards to the bottom of that deck so you can only ever have one edict card but if maybe if you don't like the one that you have you can go to Nottingham draw another one then return one of the two to the bottom of that edict deck and then you also earn one prestige point and three coins so um, if you watch the uh, example turns we'll probably move to a few of these other locations and see what uh, you can get at those encounters but I think that pretty much sums up how you play so I don't think there's much to do to set everything back to how it was at setup I think it's pretty much like that so why don't we move on to some example turns all right so we're going to start with our example turns this is our first player so first thing he will do is draw an event card and we'll look at it Another end of round one. At the end of the round, each player may choose another player to discard one faction card if able. And remember, a faction card is a one of the cards in their hand um, that is the color of the faction that their character is. If they target an ally, they gain two prestige points. All right. 
So nothing to do with that right now. And then if they, if we had a neutral player, they would have to use this token to determine which faction they're supporting this turn, but we don't have a neutral player, so now we just go on to the uh, travel and encounter phase. So uh, in the first round, that's just where players will place their, they get to place it on the board wherever they want. Alright, so this player is going to place Friar Tuck here in Gloucester, I guess is how you say that. So he gets a red banner card. He gets uh, one uh, provision card. You know, it shows one random card. Um, so this is what he drew. And then he gets to take a coin from the supply. And that's it, of course. If a green player went there, they could have taken a green banner card or actually either player could choose to take a red banner or a green banner card there is sometimes you may uh, choose to take a card that uh, would seemingly support an, your other another the faction you don't belong to but sometimes you have a reason for that uh, but anyway so that uh, is it for the Friar Tuck player. So now we move on to the player to the left, which would be the Sheriff of Nottingham player. I think he's going to go to Cambridge. And there he gets to take two coins from the reserve and one card of his choice um, from the reserve. So there's his two coins. We'll put that in his area. And then he gets to choose a coin, a card of his choice from the reserve. Now we know from his edict that he wants the king's treasure track to reach zero. So it's probably good for him to have these empty treasure tr chest cards um, so he can put them into the crusade deck and get the track to move towards zero. So he's going to add that to his hand. All right, that's going to be his turn. Now we move on to Isabella. So Isabella, you know, when she was had her card, she got... A couple of hourglass and a couple of chess card from the opposing faction um, so actually that works out pretty good for her because she is going to go to Norwich and you'll see if you return two red hourglass and two red chess cards you get two prestige points and three coins so that's what she's gonna do so she'll return these two uh, chest cards and two red hourglass cards to the reserve and then she gets two prestige points and three coins so we'll take her prestige points and three coins all right and that will end her turn so finally we have robin hood now of course he can't go to where any of the other uh, characters are already at. You can't be at a location that somebody's already at. So I think uh, he's going to go to York where he gets to uh, get one coin. As well as one random card. So one card from the top of the provision deck. And then a choice between taking a red hourglass or a green hourglass card. His edict is he gets uh, prestige points for each hourglass card in his hand at the end of the game. So I think he will take a red hourglass card and put that in his hand. And that will end his turn. And I don't know if you noticed this, but uh, I actually gave that coin uh, to Friar Tuck and that random card I took to Fire, Friar Tuck. And they should have gone to Robin Hood as it was his turn. All right. So that ends uh, everybody's travel and uh, encounter um, phase. Now we move on to purchasing. And so we see because we're in the first round, uh, a horse costs three, a boat costs three, a faction skill costs three, 
a card of your choice from the reserve costs three but a random card is one and a prestige point is one so Friar Tuck I think he's gonna get a random card so he'll take one from the top of the provision deck all right now we go to and he actually has this power at the beginning of the purchase phase you may trade one faction card from two for two random cards uh, but I don't think he wants to do that um, Sheriff also has that um, so maybe he does want to do that. So since he belongs to the Prince John faction, a faction card for him is green. So he is going to do this at the beginning of the purchase fade. You may trade one faction card. So he's going to trade this for two random cards. So he gets to draw two from the provision deck. And let's see what he got. Well, I got a red banner and a green banner. So is that good? We don't know yet. Uh, but now he needs to decide if he wants to purchase. And just to show some, we'll say, yeah, he's going to buy a horse. Well, we know horses cost three this time. So he's going to return three coins. And he'll take a horse. And he'll place that on his mat. And now he can move up to four spaces in the travel phase instead of three. All right, on to Isabella. She has a power at the beginning of the purchase phase. You can discard one card to gain one random card. She's not going to do that. And I think <clears throat> she's going to buy a faction skill. So we know uh, that that costs three coins. So she's going to spend three. And she is the Richard faction. So she takes one of these. I mean, she's the... Uh, John Prince John faction so now she'll have this skill going forward after resolving an action on a green location draw and discard one card and finally we come to Robin he's only got two coins um, we'll just say he decides he's not going to uh, do anything in the purchase phase so that wraps up the purchase phase so now we come to where we uh, contribute to the crusade so what is Friar Tuck's edict? He wants the King's Return track to reap zero. And for that to happen, he wants uh, red hourglass cards in the Crusade deck. So he's going to look and see what he's got. And of course, this is all done secretly. I'm playing solo, so I'm turning the cards face up. But um, we'll say he's going to add this one. He's got one uh, red hourglass card and... And then he'll contribute one red banner card. So uh, that's what he's going to contribute. So now we go on to the sheriff. Well, as I mentioned earlier, we know the sheriff uh, wants the king's treasure track to reach zero. So he's going to put a couple of empty chests in there. So he'll take this one and this one. And he's going to contribute those to the crusade deck all right so that's what he's gonna put now we come to Isabella her edict is to have uh, she wants to have Saladin's banner cards in her hand so she probably doesn't want to contribute those she's only got three cards in her hand at this point uh, she spent and she doesn't want to spend her banner so she's gonna contribute uh, empty chest and a uh, hourglass card and finally we come to Robin. Now he has this special power where instead of adding two cards to the course of the crusade, which is this deck, so it's either a crusade deck and on some of these things it's also called the course of the crusade, so that's kind of confusing. Um, he may play only one revealed card as an outcome of the crusade. So that was all kind of confusing to me, but after... Uh, looking up you know what that actually means is he would not if he chooses he cannot contribute two cards at this point he doesn't pay any penalty like we talked about during the rules overview then uh, the first player would go ahead and shuffle and draw the um, number of cards two times the number of players so we're playing a four-player game would go ahead and shuffle the crusade deck draw the eight cards and then at that time um, the Robin Hood player could then play a card 
of his choice and and put it into that those he has to reveal it show what it is and play it in you know, along with those eight cards so you would have a total of nine cards so what that does is allow him to play a card <clears throat> after the others are drawn um, so he knows it's going to be you know part of um, the outcome that turn whereas if you just put two cards into the deck and it gets shuffled because usually there's more than the the eight that are drawn in a four-player game, yours may or may not come out uh, that turn as the outcome of the crusade. So it allows him to put one card that he knows is going to come as part of the outcome of the crusade. And maybe I'll show that later. But uh, for this time, I think he is going to go ahead and contribute two. Now he wants to keep uh, hourglass cards in his hand. So he's going to contribute a banner and a chest. All right, so now everybody's contributed. So now the first player will draw, will shuffle that deck. So let me get that done. All right, so that's been shuffled. Now he'll draw two times the number of players. So we know that's eight. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The remainder of these cards will remain in the Crusade deck and be used next round along with any that are added to it. But now we look at the outcome of the Crusade. Alright, so these are the eight cards we draw. So first we compare uh, banner cards. Well, we, we got two red banner cards and no green banner cards. So uh, the difference between the two is how far the army will move since there's two red and no green banner Richard's army is going to move two spaces along the track toward the end of the track all right um, and of course Saladin's army will not move he, he would have only moved if there were more green banners than red banners now we compare green hourglass to red hourglass there's two green hourglass and only one red hourglass so because there's more green than red the king's return track does not move if there had been more red than green it would move two and if they had been equal it would just move one but because there's more green than red it just does not move so let's set these aside all right and now finally we compare chests so we got uh, more green chests than red chests so that will move the king's treasure track down two towards zero if there had been more red than green then it would not have been it would not move at all and if they had been a tied if there had been a tied amount or no chess cards then it would move one but uh, <clears throat> that's it so now we're finished with the outcome of the crusade So now we uh, do the event card if it hadn't already been done, which it hasn't. So each player may choose another player to discard one faction card. Uh, um, if they target an ally, they gain two prestige points. So, you know, Friar Tuck, uh, he knows Isabella um, has few cards already, so he's going to choose her. She has to discard a faction card, so she's only got one. So she's got to discard it. All right. Now the sheriff. Well, he's going to. Uh, now he could choose as Bell, but she doesn't have any. If you do choose one of your own allies, of course, it said you get uh, two prestige points. But we'll have the sheriff choose Robin. Um, so he's got to discard a faction card. So. Uh, He'll discard a chest. All right, Isabella is going to get revenge on Friar Tuck, so she's going to choose him to discard a faction card. He'll do a chest as well. And finally, Robin, he's going to have the sheriff discard a faction card, so he'll do an empty chest. All right, let me straighten these piles up uh, a little bit. But um, anyway, that's the event card but now we get to place the uh, 
mercenary on space 15. these space 15 which is right here Cambridge and the merchant on space 7 which is here at Gloucester and all right that's going to end the event so this will now just get discarded all right, now we would check if any end of game um, condition had been met. So we know none of the tracks have reached uh, their end, so no end of game condition has been met. So then we, uh, now all the cards that were used as the outcome of the crusade get placed back in the reserve. So I'll go ahead and finish doing that off camera. All right, all those cards have been placed back in the reserve. We move the game round marker one space forward. And finally, we pass the first player token to the right, so or to the left, so now that would be the sheriff. And we'll start the next round with the sheriff. So the first thing the sheriff player will do is draw an event card. We'll see what that is. At the end of the round, each player may discard up to three faction cards. For each card discarded, they gain one prestige point. All right, it's the sheriff's turn. He's got uh, several red banner cards. And if he goes over here to Chester, he can turn those in for some of his cards for his own faction. Um, and now he's got to move along the board. He can't cross this river, but he can go... Move one, two, three. You can move through where there's a, another player. Um, and he could forfeit a movement point and stop there and uh, get a card, make, draw a random card from Robin Hood there. But he wants to go here to Chester. And he can move four because he purchased a horse. So that's what he's going to do. So he's going to go one you know, along this road, two along this road three along this road and four here to Chester. So now he'll turn in two red banners. So he's got those. He'll put those in the reserve. And that allows him to get a green banner, a green hourglass, a green chest, and one random and a prestige point. So I'll get a green banner, green hourglass, green chest, one random, those all go into his hand and then he also gets a prestige point so that was a pretty good term for for him I believe all right so it's Isabella's turn she got no cards so she's kind of in a bit of a bad situation so she's just gonna move one here to Cambridge and that gives her two coins and a card of her choice from the reserve and because she's ending her movement where the mercenary is, she gets to draw two uh, cards from the provision deck. So, all right, so she gets two coins. A card of her choice from the reserve. Now we know that she wants to have banner cards, so she's going to take a banner card. Um, and then because she's there where the mercenary is, she gets to draw two cards from the provision deck. Unfortunately, they're both red, but, you know, those could be useful at some point. So that's going to end her turn. Now, she doesn't get to use her skill because it's after resolve an action on a green location, draw and discard one card. But she did that on a red location, so her skill doesn't come into play. All right, it's the Robin Hood player's turn. He's up here in York. Um, so he doesn't have a horse so his movement is only three he's going to move here to Chester for one movement then he's going to forfeit one of his movement because he's passing through um, with an opposing player and that allows him if he forfeits one movement that allows him to draw a random card from the sheriff of Nottingham's hand so we'll say he's just going to draw this one let's see what he got eh, not anything too useful so he lost a movement point, so he's only got one movement point left. 
So he can either move here to Cardiff or Shrewsbury. Um, I don't know. He'll move. He'll go ahead and move along this rope down to Cardiff. Now this encounter, he would have to have uh, two. Um, no, these are his cards. Two green chest, which he has, but he doesn't have uh, the two green hourglass, so he's not going to be able to do the encounter at that location. So that's just going to end his his turn. All right, it's Friar Tuck's turn. He does have, he's got a green chest, a green hourglass, a green banner, so what he'd really like to be able to do is get up here to Sherwood, because he can turn those in for two uh, random cards from the uh, provision deck, three prestige points, and three coins. But unfortunately, he did not buy a horse, and it would take him one, two... Let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Without a horse or a boat, there's just no way. Even with a horse, he couldn't reach. If he had a boat, it would only take him one, two, three, but he doesn't. So he can't get there this turn. So I think what he's going to do is just go one, two here to Nottingham. And that allows him to draw an edict card from his deck. Um, if Richard's army reaches the 10 um, space. So does he want to, oh, no, he's over here. Does he want to keep that edict or the one he already has? Um, the king's return, well, that hasn't moved. At least the king's army one has moved. So I think he's going to return this one to the bottom of uh, his faction's edict deck. So he's going to keep his new one. But then he does get one prestige and three coins. So gives him a prestige point and three coins. And with that, all players have taken a turn. So now we move on to the purchase phase. So we start with the sheriff. He is going to do this at the beginning of the purchase phase. You may trade one faction card for two random cards. I think he's going to trade one of his... Uh, he's got two green hourglass cards. So he's going to trade one of those for two uh, random cards from the provision deck. <laughs> well, he traded one for two of the same. I guess that's... a a good trade and then he's only got one coin to make a purchase and so pretty much the only thing he can buy is a random card or a prestige point I think he'll he'll purchase a prestige point might as well alright so he's done with his purchase phase on to Isabella um, at the beginning of the purchase phase she can discard one card and gain one random card she's gonna do that. She's going to discard this uh, red banner card and get gain a random card. Well, I don't know that that was any better for her. All right, and um, we'll say she wants to purchase a a ship. Well, there are only two now, so she'll spend two coins, and she will get a ship, and that will allow her to plus water. All right, on to Robin Hood. He's down to two coins. I think he's going to purchase a ship as well. So he's got two coins. He'll take a ship. And uh, he didn't have a power for at the beginning of the purchase phase. So now we come to Friar Tuck. And he's got unfortunately almost all green cards which is not his faction so he is going to do this uh, trade one faction card for two random cards and he's hoping he gets two of his color well there's one ah, well that didn't work out too, too well for the old friar so he knows the crusade is coming up and he's only got one red card he would be able to contribute which is not good for him so although he would like to purchase a ship or a horse what he's going to do is spend three to purchase a card of his choice from the reserve so he's going to spend three and he will buy a red banner card 
All right, that is the end of the purchase phase. So now we'll move on to the contribute to the crusade. So the sheriff is first. We know he wants the king's treasure to reach zero for him to get the maximum points. So he's going to see what ch chests he has, empty chests. Well, he's only got one empty chest, so he's going to put an empty chest and a banner. And of course, again, you don't tell other players what you're adding to the crusade deck. Alright, so that is his turn, so now we come to Isabella. She's only got three cards, and unfortunately, two of them are red. So, she will add a green... And then instead of adding a red, she'll just lose a prestige point for not adding one card. So that's what she's going to do. Alright, on to Robin Hood. So just so I can show an example of his power, he's going to choose to do his power instead of adding two cards to the course of the Crusade. Um, now he'll play a revealed card to the outcome of the Crusade. So right now... He's going to say he's going to use his power, so right now he's not going to add two cards. So now we go on to Friar Tuck. He's got a whole lot of green, but he does have a banner and a hourglass for Richard, so he will add those. Alright, so now everybody's added but Robin, but he's using his power. So the sheriff will now uh, pick up this deck and shuffle it. So this deck um, has been shuffled, so now uh, the sheriff um, is the first player, so he'll draw eight cards, two times the number of players, so that's four, five, six, seven, eight, so that will be the outcome of the crusade, and now before those are revealed, Robin gets to use his, and he gets to uh, add one revealed card, so he's going to play... Uh, he plays into the outcome, you know, one face up red hourglass card. All right, then we reveal the other cards that were drawn. All right, this, so this is what we got. So first we compare banner cards. We got two red and two green. So an equal number, so neither army will move. Next we'll compare hourglass cards. We got two red hourglass and no green hourglass. So since there's more red hourglass than green, the king's return will decrease two. And finally, because there's more green chests than uh, red chests, we will decrease the king's treasure by two. So since that track is really moving along, the, the Richard faction are going to need to start playing more chests into the crusade deck. Alright, we've finished the outcome of the crusade. Now we do the event. Um, each player that may discard up to three faction cards. Uh, for each card discard, they gain one prestige point. Um, I don't think anybody wants to discard three of their own faction cards, um, so I don't think anybody is going to do that. Uh, but we do move the mercenary to space seven, which is where the merchant is, and the merchant goes to space 15, which is where the mercenary was. And then we discard that event card. Check for end of game. No tracks have reached zero. Go ahead and uh, put the outcome of the Crusade cards back into the reserve. So let me get that done. Alright, that is complete. Move on the round track. Uh, to round three and finally place the first player marker to the next player to the left. Alright, so I think uh, 
I've shown enough. We've gone through two full rounds. Um, so you should have a good idea of how the game plays. I don't know. After playing it, you know, by myself one time and, um, you know, the, playing it during this example turns. I'm not sure yet whether I like the game or not. I thought there was going to be a little more meat to it um, than there is, you know, just playing these uh, influence cards. Um, you know, I, I can see maybe if you're playing with other players, it might be a little more fun than when I'm having just playing this by myself. But I did think there would be a little more substance, um, a little more detail maybe to the game. I guess I should have um, read a little more about it before adding it to my wish list. Though, you know, it may, may be not bad. I can't really make a decision until I've played it with uh, other players. So I'll just say for now I'm not sure about it. Anyway, I think I'm going to wrap this up. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it.